You are listening to 95.7 FM WELT, Fort Wayne, Radioactive. The opinions and views expressed in this show are those of the hosts and guests only. They do not represent those of Free Thought Fort Wayne, WELT, or any other organization. Welcome to the Hoosier Humanist Hour, where we explore science, religion, culture, ethics, and community from the humanist perspective. Join us as we discuss those topics and more, free from the ideologies of religion and superstition. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Hoosier Humanist Hour. As always, this show is put together by the members of Free Thought Fort Wayne, a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Uh, we're really glad that you're joining us tonight. And uh, we have a couple of interesting topics for today. Seems like we'll be talking about the attempted coup in Turkey um, that happened over Friday and Saturday. And uh, we'll pick up uh, on our discussion from last week of the uh, Ark Encounter theme park that Ken Ham started with the replica of Noah's Ark. Um, just to remind you, you know, if you guys ever want to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at fortwayneaha at gmail.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that is active, facebook.com slash freethoughtfw. And uh, with that, let's get this thing going. What so are you guys are doing today? Still, I, I'm, I'm sorry, are we still oh. planning on uh, trying to organize a party to go down there and check out that Ark Encounter? Oh, um, I don't know. We won't be booted out. We have to fix our faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have to hide our identities. <laughs> Make sure we don't wear any identifiable free thought <laughs> FW, right. uh, you know, shirts or anything. <laughs> well, actually, probably a large chunk of the uh, visitors on opening day were atheists. Hmm. Like they, they 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 not only had protest groups, but they had a lot of people going into the into it, checking it out, making fun of it. <laughs> That's wow. awesome. So yeah, that would certainly be a good metric other... to look at. Yeah, mm -hmm. how many people entered versus how many got kicked out. <laughs> uh, people who are well, banned certainly some of the are... videos that I saw were from uh, atheists that were there to make fun of the place. So, you know, there's already been that. So that was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> so, Andrew had some interesting statistics on uh, visitors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. The Ark Park cost $100 million to build. And that includes... Uh, an $18 million gift courtesy of the Kentucky taxpayers, which wow. that's an unconstitutional thing altogether. And there's a huge, oh, absolutely a huge yeah. con mm -hmm. con controversy over that. Right. But regardless of that, for a hundred million dollar attraction, uh, Ken Ham said that they would bring in 2 million visitors in, within the first year. That means about 5,500 visitors a day average over the first six days the park was open usually you know attractions and parks and stuff like that have more visitors the first the first like week it's, it's usually a higher attendance average during the first six days there were only 30,000 visitors which means 5,000 visitors a day during what should be the busiest time for the park mm -hmm. ever oh yeah so yeah. He's going to fall short by a lot. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And if you think about it, you know, this is during the summer months. I mean, during the winter months, nobody's going to travel from more than an hour distance or something like that. I mean, I just can't see someone traveling from Indiana in the middle of December, or January uh, to see that park, you know, where in the summer months, you can definitely see that happening. So those numbers are going to taper off way way more in the summer months 
And it's all indoors, so it's not like an amusement park, which might have lower attendance on really, really hot days. Well, they have a they have a petting zoo outside. They don't have oh, any. They, they don't have any an, actual animals inside the ark. It's a petting zoo outside. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This side just has like fake animals and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The, In, yeah. Including yeah. dinosaurs. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. They have dinosaurs inside the ark. For some oh, reason. Oh, but they're baby dinosaurs, right? Well, they're small, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so real dinosaurs, no, are not on the ark. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I remember when Ken Ham was had that debate with Bill Nye, or if I'm not confused, he was saying that, you know, the, the big animals were just babies or something like that, yeah. so they fit yeah. them all. Right. Yeah, which still doesn't explain anything, even if they're babies, but... Because all all dinosaurs are really considered to be one kind, okay, which is <laughs> dinosaur, uh, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. Which, you know, it begs the question, like, why were they even babies? Why didn't he just bring eggs? Hey, less waste. Hey. Um, he doesn't... Dude, Noah didn't know how to incubate eggs. <laughs> no. I don't even know how to incubate eggs. Come on. Yeah, you do. <laughs> okay, maybe I do. <laughs> Well, you're kind of a snake man. How difficult is it to incubate the snake egg? I mean, it's kind of a related to dinosaurs, right? It's 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 a delicate balance between keeping it at the right humidity so that they actually grow and survive, and keeping it at too high of a humidity to where mold grows, and too low of a humidity to where it dries out. Mm, interesting. So, so it's 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 really delicate. So you're yeah. saying that if they actually did eggs on the arc it would be really hot and really humid and not fun to be on for 40 days and 40 nights i maybe maybe i don't know we'd have to we'd have to address noah for that particular question and honestly (laughs) how do you maintain humidity in a whole bunch of rain i mean does does he have a lamp or something that can keep it warm or something (laughs) I don't know. I think they had a nice HVAC system installed by the uh, local contractors of the time. Uh, well, the temperature thing brings up another question that I haven't really ever thought about. If there's so much water that, you know, it's covering all the land masses, all the giant mountains, they're up at an altitude where it's going to be really cold. Yeah, so it would potentially freeze. So it shouldn't be raining as much as snowing. True. Right, right. And the air should be, well, I guess, well, okay, but here's an interesting question. You know, if you raise the wa- the water surface so high, what happens to the atmosphere? You know, does it get as rare as it is? I mean, you know, at like well, high altitudes? I wouldn't think I guess so. I, either it would be compressed. Yeah. Or it would just shift upwards, I guess, maybe. No, no. What would happen is uh, you'd have two things happening. You'd have more dissolving of atmospheric gases into the water itself. Um, So you'd have higher concentrations of oxygen, so to speak, in the water. But you'd also have higher atmospheric pressures of every other um, gas as well. So you would have uh, maybe three atmospheres of pressure as opposed to one atmosphere of pressure um, if the entire Earth was covered in water. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But so I have another question since uh, you're kind of an expert on, on snakes. Um, I would assume snakes are kind of like um, dinosaurs. So do if, if you just have a snake egg, you know, and it hatches and you have a healthy baby snake and just let it go in the wild. Will that snake be okay without having a parent around? Like, is there parenting happening in reptiles, I guess? Um, This is a a great topic that's really been explored in the past, I want to say, maybe eight years. Um, It's been really hit pretty hard. And, And what we've seen is that parenting is most often seen in the rattlesnakes, um, the rattlesnakes are commonly seen as the most evolved um, or the most specialized and intelligent of all the different kinds of snakes. That's scary. Um, so when we look at rattlesnakes, we've seen mothering behaviors 
to the likes of which we've never seen in any other snake species on this planet. Um, so mothering behaviors that basically uh, keep the babies from endangering themselves, that protect the babies. Um, and we've seen this up to a couple of sheds um, of the babies. So no, it's not through the entire life of the baby, but at least for the first shed and maybe even the second or third shed, um, the babies have been seen to be protected by the mothers in explicit um, behaviors that would never be seen otherwise. So what's the time frame of sheds? So the time frame of sheds, we're typically talking about, depending on how much food the baby is getting at the time, so we may be talking about maybe two weeks um, at the lengthiest for the first shed, um, and then maybe another two weeks each for each of the, the secondary sheds. So we're, we're talking about a month and a half, maybe. Um, Almost 40 days. <laughs> oh, wow look at that yeah <laughs> a protection from the mother so yeah and you know not just protection but some sort of influence and behavior on how to function as a rattlesnake right all of that happens within the first month two months of a lot of animals and then they kind of back off yeah so even if there were baby animals on the ark that first 40 days and 40 nights how do those animals function properly when they're actually off. I mean, is that how the dinosaurs went extinct or other animals because they didn't know how to be an animal? They were stuck on a boat? Well, and, you know, you can tie in the, the mammals. The mammals are really the best example of that. Um, I, I hate to admit that because I love my snakeys, but <laughs> my snakeys are really so powerful instinctually that they really don't need that motherly care, so to speak. But mammals, they really do need uh, to be shown by the mother um, like for example, the big cats, they need to be shown how to take down prey, um, by how to survive in a way that permits the other alternative, um, or the other, uh, uh members of their tribe or, or, uh, cohort or whatever. Um, so they need to really learn to care for the entire herd or, um, group of animals. And they need to learn that from their parents. Uh, their, yeah, so their, uh, big cats... You know, for example, since you brought that up, yeah. uh, I think they have enough of an instinct to know what's food and what's not. But how to actually go about catching that prey is where they really need the parent to show them. Because those animals, you know, they've been evolving to be able to avoid those. And an inexperienced lion, you know, may be fairly easy to avoid. And, man, if that lion, for example, can't catch food for, for a few days... It'll start suffering. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's you know something I just had never thought about before is parenting and stuff. So do you think yeah. we can probably assume that there was some form of rudimentary parenting among dinosaurs? Or you, do you have an idea? Well, well, that's the thing is that honestly, when we look at dinosaurs, I mean, you mentioned before that um, my, my my wonderful snakeys were related to dinosaurs and, and the truth of the matter is that really dinosaurs and snakeys diverged a long time ago um and that really birds are more related to dinosaurs than snakes are um and, th and that's something that people don't, don't understand very well and I, I i'm still struggling with it uh to even understand how something as basic as the modern alligator is more related to birds than uh it is to a snake What's the uh, parenting habits of alligators? Don't they hang out for a little bit? Alligators seem to be somewhat um, parental as well. Um, they really only hang out for a, a short amount of time, a couple weeks, um, maybe as long as a month or so, at least from the research that I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they seem to be about as limited as, uh, as rattlesnakes are. But th they're still very interesting just looking at that perspective as far as what dinosaurs may have needed because if you take animals, you know, they're quote young animals or baby animals into the ark, it's hard to expect them to behave 100% mm -hmm. naturally uh, without that parental input in the first few weeks or months of their lives. Yeah. So it is an interesting point to bring that up because you yeah. wouldn't think that that would make any sense, uh, especially when you see some animals, which, um, you know, primates, for instance, if you're only taking primates in at a very young age, they're not 
they're not going to learn half of what they know oh yeah uh, without that parental input yeah i mean for primates you almost need them to be fully grown yeah 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 Yeah. well and then also you have all these different animals they require different climates they require different everything some are up at night some are not and it's insane to to get the entire world's animals to cohabitate for even a day let alone a whole month yeah i mean it's, it's ridiculous i mean you have you know animals that live in the arctic that need the cold or they'll literally overheat probably mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you have a penguin that's that's used to living at some negative temperature so all of a sudden take them to like tropical temperatures that, that, that animal won't uh, won't survive for long i would imagine right but that's where the uh, the hvac yeah. system comes into play that i mentioned oh, right. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, something now, else. Had an example is, of that. <laughs> <laughs> something else that's really important is you have a crap ton of animals together. What happens when you have a whole bunch of animals in close proximity in a kennel-like situation? Well, today we are still trying to find and eradicate kennel cough among dogs, and oh. that's what you get puppy shots for, vaccines, things like that. So I wonder how many of the animals, if this were even a real situation, would have survived being so close in such close quarters all the time with inefficient waste system, nothing to keep everything clean. I mean, it's, that is a horde of disease right there. Okay. So on the waste system, I mean, we saw the video of how the waste system worked, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. So somebody that um, snuck a camera inside, I don't know if you're generally allowed to have a camera inside the ark but they they shot a video of this monitor that demonstrated how the waste disposal system worked and i mean i i couldn't quite make heads or tails of it but there's a spinning belt that goes from the bottom to the top and there's water that comes up and takes away the waste or something like that I mean, there's some serious engineering there. Yeah, I think it was they pretty much put all the crap in a pile, and then there's this, like you said, a conveyor with buckets, and it like scoops it all up and then dumps it into the water on the other side of this wall, and it's just the seawater, apparently, just goes in and washes it all away, but it's all done by hand. So how would they have time to do anything else if they're just constantly well, shoveling stuff? I, I, I didn't have so much of a problem with the waste system as I did the fact of nutrition. Okay, even if you have baby animals, getting and collecting and preserving that much food for that many animals over that period of time using primitive technology is impossible. Physically oh, cool. impossible. You can't... Yeah. You know, you all that can't, milk is going to spoil, you know. Right, right, right. You, you're not going to be able to preserve uh, fresh meat for the lions over a period of 40 days. It's just not, it's just not possible. Well, yeah. they have an answer for that. Magic. Oh. Right. No. <laughs> well, of course, that's the answer for everything. Well, uh, if Jesus can feed an entire crowd with a loaf of bread and two fish, I'm sure they can feed an entire boat full of animals with, you know, maybe that second cousin that nobody wanted to talk about of Noah's. But Yeah, yeah. maybe it was mana. You know, maybe that's what they fed them. Yeah. Right, there you go. Fell from the sky with the rain. <laughs> Poof. Magic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Have you guys seen there's a there's a cartoon that somebody made and uh you know it, it shows two professors talking and uh there's a blackboard behind them with chalk and there's all these equations and equations and equations and uh you know there's all step one and uh you know step two is magic happens and step three is the output and the one yeah. professor goes, I think you may need some more detail in step two. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I just did a, a brief Google search here because I, I was thinking it was closer to 120 days, actually, that they had to remain at sea. And I guess I was wrong. It was actually closer to 190 days oh, yeah. that they had to remain at sea um, before land appeared. I mean, it was 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but then there was a significant period of time uh, that passed until they actually found land again. So apparently that significant period of time is 150 days okay okay so ken ham is doing the whole 
extended hours and special things for the arc in honor of the 40 days and 40 nights, the first 40 days of the park opening, he's doing that. Why doesn't he just do it for 190 days since that's how long they were actually at sea? Uriah, that requires <laughs> other modes of thinking that we're not considering right now, okay? <laughs> you have to put on your, your biblical hat. Yes, 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 yes. If they had critical thinking <laughs> skills, this wouldn't even be an issue. <laughs> yes, yes. A little tin foil hat with a big cross on it. There you go. <laughs> Oh, man, the good old Ark, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> Provided you believe. believe, yeah. What was that? Provided you believe, yes. Oh, Provided you believe, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, with that hat on, I guess you were supposed to believe that a guy lived in the belly of a fish for however many days and nights and Plus. all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. Have they ever, I've, I've heard rumors floating around time and time again about finding people actually in shark or whale stomachs that are still kind of alive. Has that ever actually happened? No. That doesn't make any sense to me, uh, just because of the fact that humans use so much oxygen because we're so inefficient anyway, you'd have to have a football stadium uh, just to survive a significant period of time inside of anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as air volume. Uh, I mean, it's sharks aren't big enough to swallow you whole anyway except for like mm -hmm. the whale shark or something right something that wouldn't normally eat a human anyway yeah exactly. yeah yeah uh, i mean even the, oxygen even orcas when they try to kill people they just <laughs> grab them and pull them to the bottom of a pool instead of you know eating them um you know yeah mm. but you know another thing that's related to uh to the ark and to the flood and to the water, I guess that I that I found just uh, just the rolling on the ground, laughing kind of thing. Um, someone on YouTube suggested that you know when the fountains of the deep opened and you know the water started gushing because it wasn't just the rain. Supposedly the fountains of the deep opened, the water was coming up from right. underneath. Right, mm -hmm. uh, that water shot shot up through the atmosphere. It left the atmosphere. It froze. And it hit the moon, and that's how we have the craters on the moon. Whoa. Wow! Yeah, not heard Talk of about that crazy one. stuff. Do they know how far away the moon is? <laughs> yes, they do. And they well, I don't know if they do. <laughs> did they, I mean the, the question is, do they realize how small of a target it actually is? Because it's not like all the water is just going to target, you know. <laughs> mm. And supposedly. The, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Ridge, I guess it's called, where the continental shelves meet. Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, the earth basically split open for the water to shoot out. So how is that even... How, how is that even in close proximity of the moon at the time? We don't know that. The moon could have been yeah. on the other side of the earth. Yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, you're, you're asking very logical questions. <laughs> uh, and the moon <laughs> does circle the earth. Uh, you know, quite fast. <laughs> so even if it was there one moment, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I've I've seen uh, Starship Troopers, <laughs> and, and they've done some uh, pretty incredible things with, you know, alien life forms launching asteroids at our planet, uh, in other planets. So I mean, maybe you can hit a bullet with a other bullet. Um, and uh, do all this at warp speed um, while accommodating for friction and variable change in velocity. Now, if you're so, at warp speed, you've got to beam three targets from two locations onto one platform. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was trying to make a Star Trek reference indirectly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so when you mentioned that, I actually read a fascinating thing. Uh, apparently, during some... Uh, police shooting, and I don't know when that happened, a police officer was able to shoot a bullet yeah. into the gun of the other guy. They found a bullet lodged into the gun of the other guy. So talking about, you know, when you were saying hitting a target with a moving target kind of thing, it can happen. Yeah, <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, That's a does. one in a it million does. shot. Sometimes yeah. you need to be lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, yep. absolutely. Um it's I mean, not luck, it's divine providence. Ah, yes. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, 
did just watch uh, Pulp Fiction recently, so I, I totally understand that. You watched uh, it without me? Of course I did. Got it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, um, definitely an interesting point there. Um, just because it's, it's so unlikely uh, that it doesn't even make sense. And I've seen a number of other people mention this water shell hypothesis. Mm-hmm. I mean, that kind of plays into this whole thing. You know, saying that the entire planet was covered by this water shell and that this water shell failed during the arc which is how we came to have so much rain uh coming down onto the planet because this water shell all of a sudden precipitated into rain um and so you know prior to the flood uh snakes venom were no longer uh dangerous to people um uh, just prior to the flood because of the high atmospheric pressures that they were exposed to during that time. Um, and so after this flood, that's when snake venom was all of a sudden dangerous to us uh, because they had much lower atmospheric pressures. None of that makes any sense because of course, uh, <laughs> at, at two or three atmospheres of pressure, um, the human body starts to break down and disintegrate anyway, yeah. much less any other life form that has evolved to, accommodate one atmosphere of pressure you know you go down into the deep of the ocean to where you're starting to experience two three uh five atmospheres of pressure you die you get crushed very 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 quickly yeah that's oh, yeah. that that's why submersibles that go down that far that far have like a like a foot of solid steel yeah be- between between you <laughs> and the outside <laughs> yeah that's right oh my gosh and- Mm. Oh, but but when you include magic, you know anything is possible. So right. true, very true. <laughs> actually, what you just said, I've heard of that. Um, I think I've heard that from Kent Hovind. Actually, like mm. he has the the the. I think he called it the water canopy theory or something. Yeah, yeah, mm. and, and yeah. It's just, I mean, it's insane. Like these people just make stuff up. And yeah. And it was kind of disappointing, like, even when I was, uh, I did this Science Central event recently, um, where we were trying to interact with the public about, uh, GMOs, really, um, genetic engineering in general, right. um, but, uh, just interacting with the public on that kind of means, and just finding out how many of my fellow educators, um, were, were these other educators honestly believe that there was a worldwide flood. And so I, I asked them, I'm like, well, so where's the evidence for that? Because one of these were, were actually a, a, a geological intern. And I'm like, so where's the evidence for that? And he's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, okay, so you're, you're wanting to go into geology as a career. And you've actually done this job for some time. And you believe in this flood. But you don't seem to have any evidence for your flood. Yeah. Something is wrong here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sensing a disconnect. <laughs> no, you have to uh, talk about how your uh, former professor spoke, saying his science is weak. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I know the cognitive dissonance that people have to put themselves through to believe this stuff hurts me. <laughs> it it yeah. physically hurts me. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, I like that. Not emotionally uh, pain; it physically hurts my head. My my uh, my Australian and uh, British uh, professor compadres are, are notorious for using this one term, which I, I've really come to love and appreciate: the stupid it burns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've come to change my mind on, on GMOs. You know, I used to uh, see them as this awful thing, you know. Uh, but the more I read on, on the objections and stuff, the more I've realized that, realized that, you know, GMOs have nothing to do with what most people are actually objecting to. Um, and the science is, in fact, solid. It, they're safe and all that. But, you know, it's, it's easy to scare people into things, um, you know, just like, like, you know, religion 
scares you into thinking that you have this eternal hell that awaits you, uh, you know, anti-GMO people, uh, you know, make you think that this stuff is going to kill you. And um, you know, it's just, I don't know. I, I think, I don't know if there's much in terms of parallels there, but I think there is some. No, no, no. That, that makes perfect sense just because of the fact that when we look at uh, the way that GMOs work and, and we see this, this whole worldwide scare and, and fear surrounding them and getting to actually talk to people, you know, have people come up to me uh, among the public and, and talk to me about their concerns, a lot of their concerns honestly came down to whether or not they even understood what GMOs were. Okay, a lot of these people right. seem to think that GMOs meant chemical additives into uh, what we were eating. They they didn't understand that there was a difference, a completely, you know, wide end of the spectrum difference between a chemical additive and modifying the genes of the food that you're eating to make it healthier, to make it cheaper, right. uh, you know, whatever. And and so. That was really the biggest surprise to me was just realizing that there's such a huge disconnect at the most fundamental level. Um, yeah. And so once we get past that, then we can start making an actual dialogue of, well, what's the, uh, you know, what's the moral implications for this? What's the ethical considerations of messing with the genes? Right. And well, so there's a lot of people that just in general misunderstand science and how science works and stuff like that. I was recently talking to someone that's into humanities and, you know, we're talking about, you know, how the scientific method works and this and that. And this person was trying to convince me, you know, was explaining that humanities use different methods and, um, you know, determining what's true and isn't. They somehow arrived. To it in, in different ways almost and to me that just sounded like you know you just sharing your opinion and personal experience which just it sounds like it's not a valid uh, way to, to to get to that but since a lot more people are familiar with those kind of methods you know they're a lot more inclined maybe to to believe the alarmists that use no science, but at least they understand the reasoning and how they, and then the process of reasoning, as opposed to the scientific process, which is very rigorous, which is very established, which requires verification and testing and, and repeating and large sample sizes and, and all this to uh, distinguish a real result from just an accidental result. And, and, you know, that was the other thing that I, that I helped uh, some people understand was I, I'd sit there and I'd ask them, well, what do you not like about GMOs? And they'd sit here and they'd say, well, I just don't approve of how they're not really tested. And I'm like, OK, well, describe to me how they're tested. And they're like, well, I don't know uh, how they're tested. I'm like, OK. But you don't approve of it? So, yeah, you don't approve of it, but you don't know how they're tested. Yeah. And then they go you further and they say, they'd sit here and say, well, I, I just don't think they've been tested uh, as well um, to show the long-term effects. I'm like, okay, well, let's look at that. How do you think some of the other things in your life have been tested for long-term effects? Exactly. They're like, well, uh, <laughs> like, okay, so we're getting somewhere now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you spray bleach on your countertops every day, you know, and you eat off of them in many cases. <laughs> um, you know, the one thing that I've encountered was people misunderstand the use of pesticides and GMOs. And a lot of times they think that GMOs necessarily lead to huge amounts of pesticides and herbicides <laughs> and whatever is being used. And what I want to tell those people is, so you don't really have a problem with GMOs. You have a problem with a pesticide. Right. And, you know, just because some farmers are using too much of it doesn't mean that that's what they're supposed to do. And, in fact, a lot of a lot of times, you know, GMOs are made so you, you don't have to use as much chemicals on them to keep them, you know, 
to keep the plants healthy. Um, and, you know, they don't understand that even with, uh, you know, quote unquote organics, there's still pesticides involved. You know, you're vir it's virtually impossible to not use any kind of pesticides. Like it's just it's just not possible to have large scale agriculture. You know, all these monocultures like acres and acres of corn and whatever, without using pesticides. Like that's not possible. Yeah, so, and and that's and that's one of the things that's been kind of cool looking at GMOs is is how they've literally reduced the use of pesticide by half in the past what ten or fifteen years. They've reduced the use of pesticide. Sure. And so when, when people try to sit here and say, well, the GMOs contain more pesticide, uh, you know, when you're talking about GMO foods, it's like, well, okay, let's just concede for one moment that that's possible. Possible that the GMOs contain more pesticide than they did before. Guess where that goes? That goes to an evaluation agency that evaluates whether those pesticide levels are within the toxic limits of humans. And they pass. Oh, yeah. That's why you still eat them. It's because right. they pass those regulations. Well, and you think about it this way. Pesticides go on foods to keep foods from rotting or, you know, it keeps pests away, all of that. And people don't want to eat something with a lot of pesticides used in its growing because they don't want to get the pesticides in their system. Fine. What about... Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, sanitizer, hand sanitizer. Well, people use hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer all the time on their hands. They're walking around, but if you're at a restaurant, I've seen lots of people pull out a thing of hand sanitizer, rub it on their hands, disinfect it so they got clean hands, and then they eat. They're pretty much ingesting everything in a much higher quantity than is on any food they buy in the store that is all over their hands, unless they actually go to the bathroom and wash it off. That is straight up chemical crap right there. And they're not oh, complaining yeah. about that. And and what's in hand sanitizer is is not good for you. <laughs> no, you don't eat that. And yet, you know you don't want you don't want to eat hand over. sanitizer. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's just people that are I think are unfamiliar with how science works and the scientific process, and I think that's why they're inclined to believe some of that nonsense. Even going back to the Noah's Ark, you know the fact that. You believe that you can have a seaworthy ship of that size constructed completely of wood is a scientific question. And, you know, Bill Nye in the debate with Ken Ham already talked about that, that it's quite literally not possible to build a wooden ship of that size and have it seaworthy, and especially, you know, Supposedly, all that rain and floods and all that. I mean, I don't think those seas were very calm, so it would have had to survive, you know, maybe some waves, some things like that. Um, you know, that that thing would have fell apart without without some metal to to brace it and um, to support the structure. It, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. But you know, this this narrative is so compelling that. You know, people just tend to accept it because everybody else accepts it and it's the popular thing to do. And, um, you know, ah, we don't need, uh, you know, verification and, and study and numbers. And, um, well, that's why you Christianity know. is one of the most, the most popular religion because everybody else does it. Oh, sure. Yeah. At least everybody else does it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's not a coincidence that. You know, in any given country, most people follow one particular religion. You know, I think it's um, it's very unusual to have the population of a given country to be less than like 70, 80, 90 percent of the same religion. And if anything, that that may have changed over the last, you know, few decades, I think previously, uh, you know, to maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. You know, I mean, even in the U.S., it was probably like 90 percent Christian if you go back about 50 years. Today, I think it's just over 70, maybe 75 or something like that Christian. Um, and, you know, if you, if you just think about all the other regions of the world, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet money that that's the case. So. But you, you see the same thing with GMOs, right? So you see... Uh... Uh, Europe, 
number of European countries banning GMOs. Oh, so sure. obviously they know what they're talking about. Obviously that's a cool thing to do. So why not just trust them, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, love the that, that's a popular that's a popular thing actually. I think in some liberal circles to say, well, look at what the Europeans are doing. You know, that's often brought up with healthcare. That's often brought up with uh, social programs. That's often brought up with all kinds of other stuff. And so by extension. You know, if you already think Europeans are doing things better uh, in all these other aspects and you see them banning GMO corn, you know, it's not much of a leap to say, well, if the Europeans are doing it, they must be right. You know, 300 million Europeans couldn't be wrong. You know, the whole country of Britain just stepped out of the EU, so maybe everybody else will follow. It's a whole bunch of people that did it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Actually, I hope they don't. I mean, I, it would really be a shame to see yeah. Europe disintegrate. Uh, but, you know, we don't really have a vote there. No. Oh, wait, wait. Can we tell the whole world that? Something that the U.S. does not have its nose in? <laughs> uh, yes. Well, most of those countries are members of NATO, and we kind of leave NATO. So, you know, <laughs> we kind of sort of have our fingers there, you know. Several, you know, military bases in Germany. <laughs> you know, like we see it, we'll allow it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, well, do you guys want to move on to the uh, attempted military coup in Turkey? Yeah, I didn't hear anything about that until today, and I was just a little bit floored by the fact that a what seemed to be stable government just got turned upside down almost and kind of makes you think i wonder if that could happen in anywhere else in the country in a more first world or even second world yeah i mean it almost reminded me of something that uh my wife showed me uh, a certain movie with gerard butler um, <laughs> what was that called again uh olympus has fallen i love that movie thank you yeah, right, it was fun. Right. like it, it sounded like a pretty pretty uh hardcore uh, development to have all those different people coordinated to achieve this one objective and uh, to almost actually succeed at it was pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's like a military coup style thing, even even like a foreign takeover, kind of like the way it was described in that movie, we're pretty hard to pull off in the U.S. because, I mean, we have a strong federal government, but still, power is somewhat decentralized. So even if you were to take over Washington, um, you know, that's, that's only a Pentagon? small fraction. Well, right, right. But, I mean, the Pentagon, you can say, is kind of the, the brain of the military. But nothing is actually in the Pentagon. Like, there's, no re there's not much of weapons or anything like that. Like, all the warships, all the airplanes, you know, that's all in other places. Well, yeah, but the mines, the people who are at the Pentagon, I would imagine, would have, you know, the capability and the communication to move forces to where they need to be within minutes to, you know, right. take back the White, White House. The White House? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, you would certainly... US, the, US, the United States military forces are not centralized whatsoever. Uh, granted, yes, there are a lot of high-ranking officials at the Pentagon, but that's mostly politics. Mm. That's where they make the. That's where they make the. The administrative administrative decisions, is there, so okay. like where to spend money at. Uh, let's make sure we get people over to Congress to get this approved, push through. That's what the Pentagon is there for, um, for the most part. Anything that is strategic, is done, all over the world. And like, there's NORAD. There's a, bu a bunch of other places under mountains uh, that ha they that's what, that's what they are there for. <laughs> right under mountains. Yeah, yeah a lot of bunkers under mountains. <laughs> NORAD. <laughs> yeah. And just the sheer size of the U.S. in terms of square footage, you know, uh, I, I I don't see a successful takeover. Uh, you know, in terms of like a small force kind of taking over, I mean, certainly disrupting, sure. Um, Red Dawn! You know, economy, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
you know, what, what do you guys think? I mean, do you think it's it's possible to one day have a, a military style coup here in the U.S.? We can't even agree on a nominee for the Democratic Party, and we looked at the Republican nominee. So, no, I don't think that we'd ever be able to be that organized to have one common goal. Yeah. What about in terms of just the military itself, though? Like Even the military is divided on such an issue. I mean, it, it depends on, as much as I hate to say it, money talks. You know, if you're talking about the military, isn't the military and the people in the military, as in most of the people on the grunt level, they're only interested in what's going to help the military and their paychecks. And so aren't they going to go for the person who's going to sign it? But then you have the opposite of the people who may be a little bit more of a brain, maybe a little bit more higher ranking. They know what would happen, or more than likely what would happen, depending on who is in the White House or not. And I would think that that would be kind of a, a curve ball when it comes to you have the masses versus maybe a slightly smaller group of them with the exact opposite opinion. I mean, if it, it's, it'd be one thing if the whole military agreed as one unit and decided just to take it over and deal with it. But, you know, then you come into the play where you have the military. What about military families? You know, we're all connected right. militarily right. to someone. Yeah, and I think also the military here is not just one solid body. I mean, you have the Marines, you have the yeah. Air Force, the Guard, yada, yada. You know, so even there, uh, you know, those branches don't always play nice with each other. Exactly, there's constant. Uh, yeah, yeah. So to organize that would be, would be fairly difficult, where in a country like Turkey, um, I think they've had something like four or five more or less successful overthrowings of the government where the military has been involved um it was either three or five i don't remember how many it was over like the last 50 years um and you know some of them have been just an outright military thing some of them have been in conjunction with like turmoil in the country and um, other political upheavals and stuff from what i understand um but it's very interesting. So with this with this military overthrow um, attempt in in Turkey, uh, the president there, Erdogan, has blamed what's called the Gulen network for that um, attempt. Although they deny that they were involved, but uh, Fatullah Gulen, I think that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, is an Islamic cleric of some kind that is uh, actually based in Pennsylvania out of all places. I thought that was, uh, that was fairly interesting um, that, you know, potentially someone from the U S could have been pulling the strings on an attempted military overthrow of government in another country. Now take that a step further. If it actually was for someone in the U S would they be working under the U.S. interest or in their own minds, the benefit of the U.S. or you say Islamic, would this be connected more to ISIS or you know, not even ISIS, but their allegiance or the main benefactor would be somebody in the Islamic religion or, you know, in the Middle East who, who would benefit mostly from a military coup in Turkey? Well, so from what I've read about this Gulen guy, um, he follows some kind of a middle of the road uh, Islamic uh, tradition, and you know, uh, uh, from what I've read, you know, it wouldn't be in his style to do this kind of military overthrow of the government. Uh, and he certainly isn't working for like the U.S. government or ISIS or anything like that. Like, if anything, he'd be working for himself. He used to actually be an ally of Erdogan until a few years ago when they somehow had some kind of falling apart uh, or, you know, like a rift in between them. And, uh, you know, Erdogan became his enemy. And so supposedly uh, this Gulen guy has been building this network inside of Turkey of people like, let's say you want to get into the police academy and you want to grow in the police force. Well, it's much easier if you're part of his network, because the higher ups are part of the network, so they pull you up 
And so supposedly in that way, he like infiltrated the military, some of the government, the police, like he supposedly wields a whole lot of power. And according to some of the conspiracy theories, um, you know, Erdogan actually staged this coup just to be able to get rid of that kind of alternate power structure inside of Turkey. Well, yeah, didn't one of the uh, top officials for counterterrorism found behind something all shot up and dead? Um, you mean inside Turkey or? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I haven't haven't heard of that. It's totally possible. Yeah, I think it was one of the top level officers was found tied up and shot and he was dead because he apparently went to a meeting thing as part of all of this happening at the same time. Wow. Well, there's certainly some kind of major, um, you know, um, what do you want to call it? Um, cleanup happening yeah. inside. You know, I mean, thousands of people have been arrested. One thing that I found really crazy, uh, apparently, even people in the Department of Education are getting sacked by the thousands. Like, we're talking huh. teachers, university professors, uh, like, I don't know if the janitors are being sacked, but like, I mean, something to the tune of like 15,000 people from the Department of Education are getting sacked. Basically, like anybody that's ever said anything against Erdogan probably is getting cleaned out of there. So even like uh, Amnesty International has come out and said, OK, you know, I mean, we understand you just had a military coup and you got to, you know, clean up things. But. Okay, you're you're getting a little ridiculous there. Um, yeah. yeah. I wonder if they're using it as an excuse to get rid of people that they initially wanted to get rid of in the education. I mean, I, I, I wonder how Turkey's education system is set up. If is it is it more like the Middle East or I I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's all just a plan to clean out education because that's kind of the core of where people get their ideas. Well, you would, I mean, I would think, two and, two. Uh, yeah, um, you know, a lot of, if you look at the United States, a lot of the higher educated professors and stuff are much more liberal minded, much more likely to be, to have secular values and things like that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's true among academia all over the world. And, you know, Erdogan has kind of been sliding into a more kind of tight Islamic uh, style of, of government has even tried to pass some laws and stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if those people were just inconvenient to him and he just found a good way to get rid of some, you know, liberals that yeah, are in his way. There was also, I, I, I read somewhere, uh, something somewhere in the thousands of judges were also being sacked, which you know, I also I understand. Because, yeah. Well, but, you know, it's not like a, a judge would jump in a military coup, you know. But, but the, the, I think a lot of that stems from this this uh, this, oh, the, uh, this this document that they found that had a bunch of people listed to take over certain positions, um, mm -hmm. provided that this coup was successful. So they were literally planning on restructuring the entire government um, based on taking out the current government. So anyone whose name was on that list, yeah. Name's Mud. Presumed to be involved, huh? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Very interesting. So that Very... part actually made sense to me. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. It, it basically it, it really rang a bell to, uh, um, what was that movie with Tom Cruise? Um, it was all oh, about Germany takeover. For Hitler. Anybody else see that movie? Oh, uh, um, what was it called? Uh, Valkyrie? Valkyrie, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see the second half. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. about Valkyrie. the attempted assassination of Adolf Hitler by one of, by his uh, by one of his other uh, high ranking officers. Yeah. A briefcase bomb in a meeting room. Hitler was running a little late, and survived. <laughs> and that was a true story, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. That yeah, was yeah. that was that was based on a true story. Yeah. Well, isn't that one of this Something's... coup didn't work? Is because somebody got on a plane when he wasn't supposed to be? Well, the the uh, Erdogan didn't he leave an area like twenty minutes before they did the, the yeah. coup? 
Uh, well, he was just about to to leave. Uh, or something like that. I mean, I think the coup started, and then he flew out of his vacation spot back to Istanbul. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and you know, 20 minutes later, then they came and showed up. But that's all it took. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why, you know, a lot of people are circling those conspiracy theories that he did it himself. Because it, it, it almost seemed like it was too easy to squash. You know, you would think, if you're if you're starting a military coup, you, you're pretty certain that if you fail, you'll get charged with treason yeah. and either thrown in jail for the rest of your life or have the death sentence. I mean, they're trying to actually revive the death sentence right now in Turkey for the people that have been involved. Because uh, Turkey doesn't have the death sentence since 2004, I think, as a result of like negotiations with the European Union. Because you can't have the death penalty in the EU, so they gave it up. Even though they hadn't used it since like '84, mm -hmm. uh, they officially removed it. But he wants to bring it back so he can. I mean, that that just tells you, you know. I guess if you want to fan the conspiracy theories, you know, just he's trying to make sure that the secret never comes out, you know, by eliminating those people that are inconvenient. Well, somebody said that one of the dudes who was sitting in the office with the people trying to connect the network saying that. He actually cracked a joke about saying, what's this FaceTime? I need to get me some of that. I was like, okay, oh. you're about to die and you're making a joke. Right, that's right. That's what I would do, but I guess that's just me. You're an atheist. You're weird. <laughs> 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 well, that was the crazy thing is, you know, in the I, I happened to accidentally catch the news on that and just followed it straight through basically minute by minute. And at some point in time, Erdogan got on their version of CNN over the journalist's cell phone and FaceTime. You know, at that time, I, I thought, okay, well, maybe this coup has something to it. You know, maybe it's got some teeth and it can succeed. Because to think that the president of a country, his only way to get on TV is through a journalist's uh, cell phone, you know, that, that just kind of seemed crazy, especially when you consider previously that, you know, all those cell phones and FaceTime and all that caused him a lot of trouble with protests and things and organizing all that. Definitely a lot of, a lot of conspiracy theories and uh, interesting things happening there. But luckily, I think we concluded the U.S. is safe from military takeovers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have, uh, we have Gerard Butler, so we're okay. <laughs> and Tom Cruise. That is all the time we have for you this week. This has been the Hoosier Humanist Hour. Be sure to check out Free Thought Fort Wayne on Facebook and on meetup.com. Thank you for listening, and we hope your days are filled with logic, reasoning, and the eternal quest for knowledge.